but I think we almost have everyone. So thank you guys so much for joining us on uh, this Tuesday morning or afternoon, depending on where you guys are. Um, we're really excited to get this summer speaker series rolling along, and we're really happy to have with us Maddie today. Um, before we jump in and hear from Maddie, I'll just introduce uh, myself and our organization a little bit. So my name is Ben Summers, and I'm a program manager at States 4-H International Exchange Programs. We're headquartered in Seattle, Washington. And what we do is we organize and implement exchange programs through 4-H in a number of different states across the US. So right now, I think we're working in approximately 25 states. Um, and we offer exchange programs that are both hosting within the US and then also international youth going abroad. And we're gonna hear a little bit from Maddie about her experience working with those programs specifically. We also have programs where we bring high school youth from overseas to stay in the US with volunteer host families for one year. Uh, and of course, this year being the very unusual and challenging year it is, we aren't exactly sure what those programs are gonna look like for the remainder of the year, but uh, we're hoping that we'll still be able to, to get some youth here at some point uh, this coming year. But in the meantime, while uh, we're trying to have as many conversations as we can with our community about the importance of exchange um, and the way it could impact our the communities that we work with. So with that, uh, we're very excited to have with us Maddie Harda from Wisconsin 4-H International Programs. And Maddie has long-term connections with States 4-H. So she started as a youth participant and is now one of our professional colleagues. So we work with Maddie as a peer uh, supporting our programs in Wisconsin, um, as well as a lot of other work that they do within the state. She actually traveled to Japan and we'll hear all about her experiences from her. She traveled to Japan over 10 years ago as a youth participant and is now again, like I said, uh, working with Wisconsin 4 International Programs. And in between, she also worked as an intern for one of our Japanese partners uh, Lex Hippo Family Club. Um, and so she has a real uh, breadth of experience and expertise, and we're just really excited and thankful that she's joined us today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maddie uh, and let her take it away. So Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, hi, folks. Really glad that you're coming on today. Um, it's a roasty day here in Wisconsin, so I was telling Ben, I apologize for my backdrop. I'm in the basement trying to keep cool. So, you know, it looks a little creepy, but bear with me. Um, so I have a little PowerPoint with some pictures here. I'm gonna pull that up real fast, share my screen. Alrighty. Yeah, so as Ben said, my name is uh, Madison Hartup. Uh, my nickname is Maddie, and I go by either Madison or Maddie. And so I just want to kind of give you a little bit of my story, you know, and share my experience with 4-H and with international programs and just kind of how that's affected my life and brought me to where I am today. Um, so I'm, I'm from Wisconsin uh, and I'm from a small town, about 10,000 people in South Central Wisconsin. Um, I've been a 4-H member since middle school. And in 4-H, I really enjoyed the cooking project as well as drawing. I did archery for a little bit and um, loved volunteering with my club. Um, so I was really stoked when in high school, I heard about the opportunity to actually go abroad through 4-H. Um, as a middle schooler and as a high schooler, I really was interested in Japanese culture, kind of got into it through the popular culture with the comics and the anime. Um, but really wanted to learn more about daily life and have opportunities to interact with a Japanese host family. So I was really stoked to have that opportunity. Um, that was, yep, over 10 years ago, back in 2009. I can't believe it. Um, I was 16 years old. Uh, and I stayed with a host family in Tokyo uh, for one month. And um, this family, their name is the Suzuki family. And uh, it was just a, a really eye-opening experience, being away from home for that long, um, you know, kind of being on my own a little bit, but, but having that, that family life around me um, was just such a formative experience. And 
I didn't really speak any Japanese at the time, um, but it definitely, the connections that we made as a family, just doing activities together, eating dinner, um, getting ice cream, playing games, um, going out and, and visiting different spots in Tokyo, um, that really forged a strong bond and connection that um, really made me passionate about exchange programs and um, in particular about the uh, 4-H, the state's 4-H and Wisconsin 4-H international programs. So flash forward a little bit. So I ended up going to University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and there I majored in East Asian studies and professional Japanese communication. And so interestingly, I, when I was deciding where to go to college, I was kind of between a couple of choices. But what ultimately sealed the deal for me going to UW was the fact that I had the opportunity to work in the Wisconsin 4-H International Programs office. So in high school, after my had returned back from Japan, um, I was volunteering every summer with the international programs in Wisconsin and really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know the staff and the participants of the programs who would come. So um, when I ended up going and selecting UW, that, that professional opportunity to be able to work with international programs as a part-time position as a student was a huge draw for me um, because of just the fact that I, I really value international programs and you know, wanted to be able to, to give back to it in some way. And you can also see from my major choices, I think that's definitely influenced by my international experience. I had always been interested in, in Japanese culture for sure, but I think um, you know, really making that personal connection with my host family and with the people that I met there and just seeing that there's lots of different aspects to Japanese culture. It's you know, like, like America, it's not all cut and dry. There's no kind of one lifestyle or one type of Japanese person. Um, that made me interested in, in learning more about Japan and, and also just about East Asian countries and cultures in general. Um, and then also feeling compelled, right, to learn the language and to be able to communicate better um, with folks from other countries. So, Yep, as I had said, I worked in the international programs for those four years as a programs assistant. Um, and what an opportunity that was. You know, I really can think back to some of the more formative experiences and, oh, oh hello. And um, this experience was so amazing for me as a way to, not only be involved more with international programs, but to really to see the work and um, the logistics that go into creating international programs, hosting folks from other countries, um, sending 4-Hers overseas. Um, I had the opportunity to really to see how that works and to have a real hand in, um, in creating and implementing those programs. So just to, just to clarify, in Wisconsin, um, we receive folks from a variety of different countries in the summer. So you can see here, we've got some kids from Japan, from actually from Lex here in this photo and the green shirts. Um, but we also you know, receive uh, Japanese uh, delegates from Labo. Uh, we receive Korean delegates from um, Lex. And we also receive uh, Mexican delegates. That's the photo uh, with the, in front of the Capitol there. Um, and we also do receive the other states for each countries like Costa Rica and Norway and Finland. So it was a really, it was a great chance to be able to work with different groups and different cultures um, and get to experience that better. And because I was on for the full year, I had the opportunity not only to assist with the summer programming, but also with the, the year-long program with our, the high school students who come from a variety of countries to the U.S. to live with a host family and study at a high school. So, I mean, I, I just think about it and I, I don't even know if I can, I can iterate really how, <laughs> how many different skills and, and opportunities I had, um, you know, professionally. Um, planning events and working with students and counseling students and running orientations 
um, you know, I just feel incredibly lucky that I could have had that, that really rich experience um, as an undergraduate. And so that ultimately really shaped where I went next. Um, I had always been interested in going back to Japan, right? Um, I think I, I felt really strongly about doing that, but I decided not to do a traditional study abroad program during college um, because I knew there was an opportunity to be an intern in Japan uh, with the Japanese partners. Um, and so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted that professional development. Um, I wanted also to be connected, I think, with the same organization that I had gone um, with all those years ago in high school. And so I applied and was accepted as a Lex intern in Tokyo, Japan. And so that was for one year. Um, and during that time, you can see in these pictures here, I had some great cultural experiences. And I think what I also really appreciated was the opportunity to meet interns from other countries. So you can see here, we've got folks from Mexico, from Taiwan, France, South Korea. I got to work with this really amazing multicultural team of interns and, and get different perspectives and really bond with them throughout the internship as we did our various work projects. Um, you know, and I can think back that I think that really stemmed from, from 4-H, right? Receiving all of those different delegations in the summer from various countries and appreciating them and, and learning from them. So that's something that I've always carried with me. I, I really love the opportunity to get to work with um, a team of, of folks with different experiences or different backgrounds than myself. Um, so it was a really great work and then also the homestay. So during the Lex internship, um, interns stay with host families. Um, so you, you go to work during the day at, at the Lex office in Tokyo and then at night you go home to your host family and on the weekends you spend with your host family and you just get to hang out and live that great family life. Um, so I stayed with three main host families during my time. Uh, so you can <laughs> see here, I had the same family from 2009. Um, so the Suzuki family, I stayed with them for another six months. And just getting to see my host sisters growing up and connecting again with my host parents. Um, you know, I mean, truly family bonds, I would say. Um, just really amazing. And then my other two host families were also really awesome. You know, I think making the making the transition from the Suzuki family, the family I had had such a strong relationship with, when I had to change host families, it was pretty hard to, to switch. And I almost felt like that's when I got the most homesick, you know, it was, it was for my, my first host family in some ways. Um, but I actually ended up loving my other two host families and appreciate the time I spent with them. Um, the family in the middle here where we've got our really awesome family photo with my host brother doing this. Um, so the parents uh, of that family, they're actually Korean. Um, they lived in Japan for a while. And so it was really wonderful to be able to, you know, to see their life and to, to be present in their home where um, it's a bilingual household. So hearing them speak Korean as well as Japanese um, and picking up a few words of Korean and having those conversations together, you know, as um, just about Japanese culture and what it's like living there as, as someone who's Korean, that was um, really amazing. And I appreciate that a lot. Um, and then also my last host family up in the corner with the, the little girl, um, again, so sweet. Um, you know, I really appreciated the, the chance to have younger siblings right? I think that is, is such a unique experience. Back in the U.S., I have a sister who's a few years younger than me, but having pretty little siblings um, was also just so, so wonderful, and uh, you just get a bond in ways that are different when it's from someone who's around your own age. So, yeah, loved my host families. Still love them. We stay in touch. They're all awesome. There we go. Um, 
And I just wanted to also highlight that during my internship, um, because Lex works with, they have uh, offices in other countries. So that for Lex, there are offices in Japan where it was founded. Um, there are also programs in South Korea, uh, Mexico, and the US. And so I had the chance, because Wisconsin hosts um, Lex Korean delegates in the summer, I was able to do a work trip to South Korea and help with the orientation for um, that year's group of students. And so that was my first time in South Korea and I was able to visit Seoul and, and Daegu and stay with um, host families there and, and meet the members of, of Lex in, in Korea. Um, and I just truly appreciated that opportunity to see, um, you know, just to, to experience a different culture and to um, have more homestays, um, and also just see, right, the differences between the ways that, that Lex is coordinated in these two different countries. Um, I, I love, loved going to South Korea, and I've gone back many times for personal trips, but um, I always truly appreciate the opportunity I had to, to actually go for work. Um, that was a really unique experience. And so I ended up loving my internship so darn much, I decided to um, apply for a full-time position with Lex. Um, so that was interesting. You know, I thought kind of long and hard about it, but I, I decided that, you know, if I'm going to work abroad for any period of time, now in my life seemed like kind of the right time to do it. Um, and so I, <laughs> I went to the office of the, the president of, of Lex and <laughs> knocked on the door and said, hey, you know, I'm interested. Do you, do you think you would uh, be willing to give me a full-time position here? Um, and and they, they said yes. And so I was the first American hire at the uh, Japanese office. Um, and so for two years, I was there um, as a full-time staff member. And so I wasn't doing homestays. I had my own place, but still stayed in touch with my host families and just had the, the real chance to work as an actual full-time staff, which is just different than, as, as an intern. But um, some of the projects I worked on, you can see here, where we're reading to the little kids, I helped to, to start a new program um, where we would have uh, Lex members and um, their little children come into our office and spend some time with the interns, you know, because we have these interns from other countries um, and Lex is, is strongly focused on other languages, right, and immersing yourself in other languages. So this was a way that, you know, we could share our, our mother tongues um, with children and their parents um, in a really relaxed, playful environment. Um, I also had the chance to, you know, to help to mentor the interns who were there at the time and to assist them with their projects. So in this other photo here where we have our cute little signs, um, this was for like an online event that um, we would do monthly. And so again, I just, I loved the chance to work with the interns to, to assist them and to mentor them as they went through their own journeys, um, you know, living in Japan and working in the office. And, um, you know, I truly, I truly loved working for Lex for those two years. Um, a really wonderful, wonderful chance. And so I just wanted to say, you know, I, as I think back to kind of what is the most important thing for me personally that I can get out of the experience, well, of course, the professional opportunities, but I'm a people person, right? Like I, I, I value familial relationships and I, um, you know, I appreciate those bonds. Um, and so, you know, having these continued relationships with my host families and the friends that I made overseas um, is so important to me. So um, I had left the Lex office in 2018 and came back to the US. Um, just felt like the right time to move home, wanted to be a bit closer to family. But um, you know, I've stayed in touch with my host families and you can see here in the uh, picture, the right hand picture, um, I went back last fall uh, for my host sister's wedding. So this is the host sister that I've known since 2009. And 10 years later, I, I went to her wedding. Um, and so, you know, I continue to value um, and, and really cherish those relationships. And actually she and her husband just had a baby. Um, and so I sent their baby package the other day. 
um, with some cute little doodads from Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, I look forward to hopefully the next time I can see them soon and, and get to meet him. So, um, you know, I think all of us who are involved in international programs would say it's the relationships that are what are really keep us going. And, and for me, that is definitely the case. So where am I at today? Um, so back in Wisconsin, uh, and I am back at UW-Madison. Um, I am <clears throat> pursuing a master's degree in educational leadership and policy analysis with a specialization in global higher education. Um, you can see our, our lovely cohort right here. Um, and I will be graduating <clears throat> in December this year. Um, and so that and being led to, to this master's degree that I didn't, I did not anticipate at all. I kind of thought I would come back to the US and probably just start working right away. But when I heard about this program through a friend, it seemed so perfect, right? I mean, I think it has been shown that one of my professional passions is um, working with international programs. And so thinking about different ways that I can continue to engage with those types of programs and, um, you know, develop my professional skills, this particular master's um, seemed like the ideal option. Um, and I've really appreciated the, the opportunity to learn more about how these programs work at other institutions and just seeing how they work at a higher education level, which is just a little bit different. Um, from working with youth. And I'm also, I'm still working at Wisconsin 4-H International Programs. I'm, I'm back. Um, just half time um, in, a, in a student position, but um, again, you know, loving the chance to, to work with um, students and host families in Wisconsin. And, um, you know, I mean, it's been a challenging spring, right? I think for all of us, um, you know, programs have been canceled and, and it's just kind of the way things are right now. But um, we have had some chances to do some online um, education and outreach. And so, you know, um, I appreciate that new challenge and uh, opportunities to learn in the future um, and think about, you know, right? Like what, edu what, what do international education programs look like from here on out? Um, you know, in kind of our new normal or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like I just kind of went on, <laughs> kind of rambled a little bit there, but, you know, I mean, you can just sort of see, right, that um, things just kind of led one to the other, you know, and it was, it's really interesting how that's worked out, you know, um, unexpected opportunities for sure, but, you know, I wouldn't trade any of them for the world because, um, you know, they have led me to, to where I am today. And I've had so many wonderful experiences and opportunities b because of all of these events. Um, you know, and I, I hope that um, in the future, I can help uh, foster that opportunity for other youth, um, you know, whatever paths people want to take. But, you know, having that, that international experience um, was so formative. So, you know, I truly appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you so much, Maddie. Um, please, folks, if you have questions, uh, there's a chat box. Uh, of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with the Zoom chat function by now. Uh, but please feel free to put your, your questions for Maddie in the chat box, and we'll, uh, we'll go through them. You know, when we were at States Forge thinking about doing this kind of series and thinking about who we could really reach out to uh, to tell a story, to try to show the value of exchange and, and how it's, it's impacted their life. For those of us who know Maddie, of course, her name was at the top of the list because as she just talked about, her experiences is just as she said, it's been this path that where one opportunity has led to an opening of door, of a door to another opportunity and another opportunity. And she's followed this, this path uh, that we're it was all initiated and started by her experience going overseas. And so um, it's just such a wonderful example of the power of international exchange and the value of creating these relationships with folks overseas. So, Maddie, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, before I jump in with a number of questions that I have for you, does anybody here in the room have a question? Either put it in the chat box or you can also just unmute yourself if you'd like to. 
Hi, my name is Jennifer and I have a question. Um, how is Lex connected to 4-H for the exchange programs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so Lex has been um, partnering with 4-H um, for, for many, many years now um, for these international exchange programs. Um, and so they, you know, they, they are not 4-H programs. They're, they're different than, than our 4-H programs, but they have similar values, um, you know, values of, of understanding and, um, you know, engagement with the global community. And um, so 4-H has had this, this long relationship with Lex um, for many years, and we've been receiving um, the summer uh, delegates um, from Japan and, and these other countries, um, these other Lex affiliated countries um, in Wisconsin and, and other states as well, and um, also have been sending um, 4-H delegates. When, when 4-H delegates go outbound um, to another country, so if they go to Japan, they have the option to choose. Um, Lex or, or, or Labo is, is the other big partner in Japan. Um, and so for me, I had chosen Lex, um, and that's kind of why I ended up um, working with them. Ben, feel free to clarify. No, that's it's perfect. Been... Yeah, we have, um, I believe it's close to a 45-year relationship with these two organizations in Japan, Labo and Lex. And the programs have, have grown and evolved over time, but at their core, they're still very much the way they, they first were when the partnerships first started, which was American youth going overseas to stay with volunteer host families in Japan, found by these two organizations. And uh, both organizations have their own membership pools. So our American 4-H youth are staying with Labo and Lex member families for the most part. And then Labo and Lex member youth come from Japan, stay with volunteer host families in the U.S., most of whom are, are 4-H families. So that's kind of been the different. For Brianna Burkhead, when she spoke, she talked about being with a 4-H family. Yeah. So is 4-H part of Lex and Labo? It's a really good question. So Lex and Labo predated the 4-H to 4-H exchange that we've since been able to, to build. So 45 years ago, there weren't a ton of international 4-H organizations that were vibrant enough and active enough to really do 4-H to 4-H exchange. But of course, since then, they've grown massively. So we've been able to identify some 4-H organizations around the world that are interested in doing youth-to-youth -youth exchange. And so Korea 4-H is one of those organizations. So Labo and Lex are not part of 4-H. I think, like Maddie said, philosophically, very similar in their focus on youth development um, mm -hmm. and a big focus on language acquisition. Um, and then uh, kind of as a whole other set of programs, we've been able to do these forest to forest exchanges as well with countries like, like Maddie had said, Finland, Norway, Costa Rica, South Korea, and hopefully more in the future. So that's the way the two kind of um, complement one another. Okay, then I'll just ask one more and let the everybody else ask. Um, my other question is, um, when students are paired up with a host family to go on the exchange, so then they're gone for a month, does then the host family send their child back to the same family? Would I then host the family that my daughter goes to, um, host the child of that family? How does that work? That's always because, like Maddie had said, and I think it was such a poignant way to end her presentation, it's about the ongoing relationships, right? So a lot of the time, the family that sent a youth to another family will end up hosting a young person from that family. Uh, mm -hmm. It becomes this family to family exchange. And the, same situation, vice versa happens. So if you are hosting a student from Japan, say, and have a young person in your home, uh, the likelihood is, is pretty good that the family in Japan will then welcome your youth into their home. Um, and it does kind of naturally become this uh, family to family exchange. Maddie, I'm sure in Wisconsin, you've seen this play oh. out every single year. Right? For sure. I mean, it's not a requirement, right? So like, especially it, um, I'm thinking about, as, as Ben's saying, it's often something that's formed kind of naturally, right? So um, if, for example, um, your, your child went to Japan, um, you would not be receiving a Japanese person pro probably that same year. It, do, it does happen sometimes, but it's not usually from the same family. Um, but, but yeah, maybe in the next year. 
that would be an option. Usually Japanese families will like indicate, um, you know, something like we're open to hosting, you know, next year or, you know, that communication will, will come from them or, or from you. Um, but yeah, as Ben said, we definitely see that a lot in Wisconsin and it's, it's very cool to see these, you know, these long ongoing relationships between families. And one of the, the, the focal points of our hosting program, which I think makes it unique from some other ones, is we try to match up host sibling to participant. Uh, so the reason why you, nece you wouldn't necessarily be welcoming a Japanese youth the summer that your son or daughter was going overseas is because we want to make sure that they have that relationship, that time, that month mm -hmm. together, in the same home, and then hopefully in the following year, have that same kind of experience, but in uh, in Japan or another. So, those are great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And again, for folks, if you guys have questions for Maddie, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, I did have a question for, for Maddie, kind of going back to the beginning of uh, back to 2009 when you were first thinking about participating in this exchange program. Kind of what was the thing that made you kind of take that first step or that? leap forward to deciding that this is something you want to do. The second part to that question, if you were speaking to a young person who was considering participating in an overseas exchange program, what kind of advice would you want to give them? Sure, those are really good questions. Gotta think back. Um, yeah, I mean, I th mm, what was the leap that pushed me? I mean, I think I was so, I was really truly interested in Japanese culture at that time of my life. Um, and it just, um, I found out about the program through a friend who, um, whose family is very involved with the international programs with 4-H. Um, and uh, she, um, there's a, a daughter who's about the same age as me and she was going to Finland, um, gonna be going to Finland through 4-H that summer. And um, I think, you know, seeing, seeing her make this decision and, and hearing about the program um, from her, um, D gave me that push, you know, I, I could do this too. And, and it's, it's in a country that I'm so interested in and I really want to learn more about. Um, I think that's what pushed me to it. Um, and as for the second part of the question, um, what advice would I give? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I would say, um, you know, I, one of the things I really love about the 4-H program is that it's, it's so, supportive you know so even if you're at that point where you're thinking oh i'm interested in going but i'm just not sure you know you can reach out and um the 4-h program this the staff will give you lots of information and, and answer your questions and um i think you know because if it's um if you are already a member of 4-h right you you probably else you probably already have that relationship with 4-H in your county and in your state. Um, and so just knowing it's, it's part of that network, um, I think is, is incredibly reassuring, both, um, both for delegates and, and for parents of delegates, right? Um, and I would also, yeah, I would just advise youth who are interested or considering applying, you know, go for it if you can. Um, you know, I realize that it, it may seem, um, you know, international experiences may seem expensive, but if you, if you work together with your 4-H program, um, you know, there, there are avenues for fundraising and for, for other support. Um, and if you're passionate and interested enough, um, you know, uh, I think it, it's a really great opportunity. I hope Thanks, that answers it. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And I, you raised a couple of good points there. One with uh, and of the program being built into the larger forage structure, that's kind of what we're, we're hoping for is that because these programs are hard, that there'll be support for families uh, and especially for youth participants from the beginning to the end. Um, and kind of along those lines, because I mean, you get to see from your photos, they're incredible, they capture these incredible happy moments with, with new family members and new friends overseas. But we also know that the day to day of an exchange program can be hard, it can be challenging. Culture shock is most definitely a, a real thing and just adjusting to daily life in another culture can be challenging. So for you, and um, it could be your first trip to Japan or settling in as a professional in Japan, what were some of the challenging things that you found um, in terms of that adjustment to life in another culture? 
as a delegate or as an adult? Either, I guess. The the thing that kind of um, you still, I think, would would um, carry with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's it's difficult, but as as a youth, I mean, I remember. So it just is going to depend on. It's going to depend on the culture and in the family, but um, I do feel like in in Japanese culture there, and especially I think with with these programs, there's a real care that's put towards the delegates. You know, they really do want to, they do really take seriously the fact that they're welcoming a young person to their house and they do want to cherish them and support them. Um, you know, and so it was, I, I can remember vividly, I was 16 and I was like five foot six or something. And my host mom is, you know, probably five feet, um, a tiny woman. And we were crossing the street and <laughs> she like wants to hold my hand, you know, like, like I'm like a kindergartner or something. And it was just really cute. Like it was just really funny at the time. And, you know, so that necessarily wasn't a, a hard adjustment for me, but it was just, um, it was just interesting, you know, kind of going from a different, um, maybe a slightly different level of independence, um, you know, as, as someone who in the U.S. had my, had a, my own part-time job and, you know, was used to kind of doing things myself, um, really being around parents all the time. Um, but I loved it. I mean, I, I am, I'm a family person. Like I, I love spending time with family. So, um, I, I loved that chance. Um, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a follow-up question to that. I think something that all of us who have been lucky enough to travel have kind of realized is that we get an opportunity to really learn about our own culture by leaving it. We don't always think about our own kind of internal culture uh, day to day. And you just mentioned something there about kind of you learning and discovering that maybe independence is something that is very much a part of your culture, maybe something that as um, something you had valued or placed importance on. Um, so what did you learn about your own culture by moving away from it, by, by being in another place? Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, and it's interesting. I think we do tend to ascribe, you know, independence and like kind of, you know, the, um, forgetting the term, you know, the individual, right? Like as, as being very American and um, sometimes that's the case, not always, you know, I think that the Japanese teenagers can also be really independent in their own ways, because they can get on a train and they can go to karaoke, you know, by themselves. And, um, you know, that's not an option here in, in rural Wisconsin, for sure. Um, but, um, yeah, I have something that I, I think I, I, I appreciate about there, there's things that I appreciate about, about both cultures that I, I realized from from my experience there. One thing I truly appreciated in Japan was um, the importance that's placed on on greetings and you know acknowledging other people and 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 kind of having that ritual right. So like always saying good morning and always saying good night and um, you know telling someone when you leave at the end of the day thanks for your hard day at work basically and um, you know, the, the real importance that's placed on those greetings and, and, um, and an appreciation. Um, you know, I, I would like to integrate that more in the U.S. I think, I think that would be a, a nice thing for everyone if we could um, incorporate the, a little bit more into our daily lives. Um, and when I think of things that I appreciate about a, American culture, it's interesting. There's a, I think there's a perception sometimes that as Americans, we, we do work really hard and we can overwork ourselves and the, you know, it's, it, we're not necessarily in, in, um, don't necessarily have a great system for, for folks, um, when it comes to, comes to working lifestyles, right? Like I'm always checking our email and, um, you know, it's hard sometimes to take holidays and things like that. But um, from, from working <laughs> in Japan as a professional and seeing kind of the level of overtime and, and extra work that's expected um, for folks, um, I did appreciate that there seemed to be a little bit more separation between work and life in the U.S. Um, you know, and that's not true for everyone, you know, and that's not true in all cases, um, but that's something I noticed. And, um, and it was interesting being, I think, a... a 
an American, especially a, a you know a white American in Japan, because I felt like compared to my Japanese coworkers and some of my um, some of my East Asian coworkers who are not Japanese but um, you know are East Asian, um, there were much stricter expectations put on them for working hours, um, and I could kind of get away with a little bit less because I think I had this privilege as an American. Um, so just an interesting thing to observe, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that was very interesting. I had similar experiences myself, so definitely relate to that. Um, Want to pause again, just in case there are other questions. I saw Claire, you put a question in the chat box about the cost of travel, and that's a really good question. It's the first thing that our our potential travelers overseas think about, and um, it varies a lot depending on where what the destination is. Of course, just because some uh, countries have higher costs than others. So I think it varies between, there's a range of, of I want to say, and I'm, don't, don't hold me to this, but I think it's 1,200-ish to maybe 15 or 1,600-ish for the month. Um, and that does not include airfare, which is, of course, a really significant piece of it during peak travel season in the summer. So something to think about if you are thinking about budgeting for an overseas program. Uh, it does include insurance and the international partners fees and the host family stuff and, and meals and things like that. So um, that's a ballpark. I think it's pretty accurate, but I'm not, don't hold me to that. Um, we also do have a two month, eight week program um, in Japan, which has a language learning component to it. And that one is a little bit more because it's another month of structured intensive Japanese language. So um, all the info I think is available on our website. Um, so, yeah. um, so we're going to wrap up pretty soon, but I wanted to just ask Maddie one last question, which was for us, the goal of these programs is really to help youth participants gain a new part of their identity as global citizens to really see themselves as part of a global community, um, which I think we could all agree is, is really important in these times when we all need to work together as a global community to tackle clearly what are global problems. Um, so, Maddie, do you have, um, I guess, thoughts on what you would hope for a young person who is an alumni of our program, who identi does identify as a global citizen, what they should bring to their, or what they could bring to their community in terms of playing a role as a global citizen, playing a role as a, a different kind of leader in their community, whether it's their forage club or it's their social circles, circles, their schools. What can the program, I guess, give to the community? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think um, a couple of things. So I think, first of all, it helps you, hopefully, I think it, it does help you view experiences as not universal. So what I'm saying, what I mean by that is, you know, if you have an image of what a Japanese family or a Japanese life looks like, and then you go to Japan and you, you live the family lifestyle and you meet other people, your expectations might change, right? Like you might actually start to understand, wait, like it's not exactly what it is in the movies or in the comic books or whatever. It's, it's a bit, it's more nuanced than that, you know? and um, I think that experience is really important, you know, that you can kind of go into situations um, in whatever path you take in life, but, you know, taking um, the people that you meet and the people you work with and realizing that they come from different experiences and different backgrounds and perspectives than your own. And, and hopefully, right, what you end up getting from that is you can um, draw on those different perspectives and, and opinions to, um, you know, to create uh, you know, better, um, better programming or whatever work it is that you do, um, or in your personal life as well, right? I, I think that's uh, being able to be a little bit humble and, and kind of and realize that and, and share those experiences is super important. Um, I think the, the other thing is, you know, um, so I think about my own experience. I'm from I'm from a small town in Wisconsin. 
Um, they're uh, it's primarily uh, white. You know, we do have um, some indigenous um, folks in the community too, but it is it is primarily um, white Americans. And so, you know, I think being able to go somewhere where you can, right, just it opens your eyes a little bit more, perhaps to diversity and and some of the different um, different current events and and different issues. You know, and um, Right, like I don't want to ever say that that my experience as as uh, as a white person in Japan is this at all the same as as a minoritized person in the U.S. I don't think it is at all, but you know I think it it does help, right? To just kind of, especially for me, because I was coming from that very privileged and you know just that lack of lack of exposure and experience, right? I think it does help to open me up to you know to other perspectives and and other people and just being less intimidated right to like ask questions and to maybe make mistakes you know if um when i uh, if i have friends from other countries or um you know friends um of other races you know i can i'm less afraid to to own my own learning you know and to um and to make those connections i hope that makes sense that's awesome. Thank you so much, Manny. I really uh, appreciate you uh, sharing so much of your own journey today and also just your, your general wisdom with, with all of us. Um, so much appreciated. Uh, with that, unless there are any other questions, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up and uh, say our goodbyes for now. Uh, we do have two more of these speaker series uh, scheduled for the month of July. We're going to have some of our year-long exchange alumni from different programs come and speak and share a little bit about their culture. So in a couple of weeks, we'll hear from Tushil from India, who just spent the last year here in the U.S. and was unfortunately uh, sent home early because of the, the pandemic situation, but still got a good six, seven months under his belt here in the U.S. And then at the end of the month, we'll hear from Daria from Poland, uh, who spent a year here in the U.S. Uh, two years ago, I would say. So. Um, yeah, we have lots of exciting stuff lined up um, and hope you'll come back and join us for, for those. But in the meantime, thank you all so much for taking a chunk of time out of your, your morning or afternoon. And a huge thank you to Maddie for coming again and, and sharing about her, her journey. Um, but yeah, with that, thank you, everyone, and have a great rest, rest of your week. All right. Take care, all. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie.